Hey, we're live here in the upper gallery at the Hoboken Historical Museum, 1301 Hudson Street. It's Friday night, May 19th, and we have a great uh, interview ahead, so I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, obviously, you could be watching on YouTube and uh, YouTube Live on the Museum's History Channel, and we'd love you to text and sign in with questions and we generally do an interview like this on the cusp of a new exhibit in the upper gallery and the graphics will kind of say it all uh, we're going to be talking with anthony janelli and uh, he's uh, doing a very exciting exhibit here uh, which are all under the theme of commuting and for the next uh, 15 minutes or so we'll be uh, sharing conversation with anthony uh, and Anthony, welcome. I'm gonna. I traditionally Hello. shake Thank hands. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Pleasure okay. To be here. Yeah, it's great. Um, so usually I start off by asking what's going on with our background photo. This is a photo that's in the exhibit, and it's also on the poster, the banners around town, and also uh, our, as our background. So what's where are we, and what's going on? Well, I'm sure a lot of people would recognize this as the Hoboken uh, Terminal uh, waiting room. And uh, like a lot of the pictures in the show and a lot of the photographs that I make, it, it's, it's not anything that you can plan or hunt for. It's always a surprise. It's a surprise to me. And uh, it just requires being ready and, um, and also... Uh, sharpening your ability to observe life. Sure. That's it. Um, so obviously the theme of your exhibit is commuting. We're in the train station, so obviously a train yeah. station is part of that. Yeah. And the waiting room is probably one of the most interesting interiors in Hoboken, at least it's most interesting public interior. Very beautiful space yeah. with beautiful light. Yep. It's actually skylighted, right? Yeah. So you get that nice even light from above yes. uh, and uh, so to when I look at this picture which you can't people can not totally see uh, there's a little girl behind my head I'm gonna move out of the way <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there's uh, the two adults uh, banjo violin or fiddle I guess violin and uh, you, you're saying you just happened upon this yeah, I was uh, I was uh, in the waiting room waiting for a train, and um, they were playing. I'd never seen any musicians in that in that room before, uh, and uh, I kind of enjoyed it for a minute, and then I decided to snap the photo, and uh, without any warning, this little girl appeared and started to do a dance. And it was just all just a magic moment. It definitely is. I mean, music brings that out in people. You know, a lot of times when I look at a photograph, I sort of create a story. Mm -hmm. And I, I did just associate this little girl uh, like she's the daughter of these two people. But you're kind of saying she just was uh, hanging out I and joining in. I don't know the full story, but she wasn't with them when I first got there. Right, no, so, it's so yeah. cool. And uh, yeah. again, that architecture, uh, I think it's beau art style, very kind of French, very European, and, uh, and very classy. And uh, I, I wish more musicians did play there. It would be nice. Yeah. yeah it would be great. Um, and uh, it's it is one of the great interior spaces. If people don't know it, you should check it out. I always like Jersey City has a beautiful train station down at Liberty State right. Park, but I always say we have one too, and we have the trains. We so. have trains. Yeah, it's a busy place. <laughs> trains are important. It can yeah, be very busy. And uh, this train station has actually gotten a little quieter, I think, because now people can bypass it using the Secaucus transfer station mm. uh, and go into New York that way. Mm -hmm. But in the day, this place was hustling and bustling. Oh, bad. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. Acoustics pretty good in there? Uh, well, it has a lot of hard surfaces with all that. I guess it's marble. And, uh, you know, that, that always makes an echo that, you know, musicians love. Right. You know, very often they artificially recreate it in a recording studio. 
but when you find a space like this, it's just calling for music. Right. And I, I sort of, you know, train stations, I think, are on a watch list for terrorism. So mm. there, you know, there are usually some uh, security around. And I just don't think of it as a joyous place these days. Mm. But with that, I think if they had musicians there, sort of like in the subways in New York, it would create a much more welcoming space. <laughs> and never really thought about it. But when I see this right. picture, it gets the wheels turning. Well, the subways in New York, there's so much else going on. That is true. Yeah, a lot of noise. Oh, man. And, and so, um, you know, it, the music isn't necessarily the best fit, even though I've seen some amazing, especially classical players in the subway. But this was just a, 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 a moment that just uh, unfolded before me and, um, you know, when I talk about the, the, the magicalness of it, if I, if I had brought them there and posed them, I couldn't have placed them in a better composition than what happened for real. You know, the way her body language and his and the little girl's position, it just, uh, it just happened. And that's, that's, that's one thing I really love about right. street photography. I, and I can see, I mean, a lot of... I, we were talking a little before we started that there are a lot of photographers that you respect and it is about that kind of proximity and relationship to one another and the space in between people and I think this picture even though I'm blocking the little girl really does show that at first I almost thought this picture was staged don't take that the wrong way but it's it's really perfect it's a compliment yeah it is meant as a compliment I'm glad yeah. you see it that way Great. and uh, so we're going to move ahead with some of the visuals you showed and this is uh, not a photograph you took but but you have c included it for reasons. Yeah, it's a Cartier-Bresson, and uh, this is Paris, uh, in the uh, post-war Paris. And uh, I think that um, of the photographers that whose street photography I admire and have influenced me, number one on the list, and I think of him as kind of the godfather of street photography, is Cartier-Bresson among others. And so uh, this is just a, a sort of a sample of his work. It's a photograph that I discovered when I was a teenager and I've always loved it. And so it's what do you magic, like about it? It's a magic moment. It's a, it's a magic moment. Mm -hmm. um, well, th uh, let's see. Um, I think, you know, um, the three photography, uh, uh, let me just uh, Street photography uh, is just um, the definition of spontaneity. And um, when we have a picture that's merely an observance or merely uh, surveillance, what's missing is some form of heart, some form of empathy, some form of fun, humor often, uh, and uh, to me, this, this photograph has all those things. I feel that um, the photographer loves this boy, the people in the background love this boy, and he couldn't be more proud. Look at him. Uh, he's bringing these bottles to his family for a big dinner, and uh, he's possibly never been entrusted with such responsibility in all of his six years of life. And, and, and so that's a mouthful, and a lot of it I invented, but this is what street photography does. It makes you invent the story. Right. And Brisson, uh, they used to use the term, the decisive moment. The decisive moment, yes. And uh, sort of take that, the moment that everything came together, you know, through the viewfinder. That's right. And, and um, it, it, I've had this conversation with other photographers. Some say it's a skill you develop. And others say it's just happenstance, right. and I don't really know the answer. Um, but like with the picture in the in the train waiting room, uh, is it luck or or you know is it a little bit me uh, being open to observing something in life, or is it just complete luck? 
I don't know the answer. <laughs> but you do have to have the camera with you. You got it. Well, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, all my pictures in this show were taken with uh, with a, an iPhone, um, uh, a great iPhone, but still an iPhone. And um, uh, we can get into that more sure, uh, when, sure. when we look at some more yeah. pictures. I mean, I love the expression of the kid. He is so proud. He's so proud. And, uh, and, and we love the, the kids who are observing it, too, in the background. Yeah. Uh, even though they're kind of, they're blurry, but their spirit kind of comes through. That I'm part of this, too, kind of yep. thing. Good, good, good. So this is from your series, one of the exhibit, one of the exhibit photographs from the exhibit we, you're calling Commute. And uh, tell us more. Okay. This was kind of like one of the first ones I did uh, for this book, and I didn't have a book in mind when I started to shoot. Um, this is the 126 bus on Washington Street headed downtown. Uh, I was riding, and um, uh, again, I just got on the bus and uh, looked up, and there are these two women. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I leave it to the viewer to invent their own story, but, um, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're very, very, very different people in the same town at the same time going about their day, their evening. And to me, that's, that's, that's just, uh, that's, that's life in Hoboken, right? That's life in many cities, uh. Uh, I just had to be ready to observe it. Right. And, yeah. So I'm just trying to think of your vantage point. I actually haven't been on the bus in a while. Mm. So are you like turned around in a seat or is this the back seat or? Um, I know. Yeah. We, I, the, the driver is just to the right. So it's the front, oh, I got the it front now. of the bus. Yeah, and definitely. I'm, You're I'm, across. I'm sitting right across. Right. And, um, and I didn't, in fact, I, I never go hunting for a picture. Um, that's a different thing. That's a different, I think, kind of photography and a different kind of street photography. I don't do it that way. I, I just wait until I see something. Right. Uh, another photographer that um, has always really heavily influenced me is Gary Winogrand. And uh, he's the master, right? He, uh, next to Brisson. Uh, and he was not shooting with an iPhone. He was shooting with a 35 millimeter reflex camera. And there's actually a, a little documentary about him, which someone uh, filmed him for about a minute, standing in Times Square in a conversation with someone and in the process of, without missing a beat in the conversation, he takes about 10 pictures. And that's how good he was. And you, you, you had to look closely to see him raise the camera, focus it, snap the picture, and go back to his conversation. It all happened like that. And uh, so that's why he's kind of like the god of that stuff for me. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm the first to admit that um, these days when you're in public, everybody has an iPhone up in front of their face. And that gives me a little bit of cover uh, to shoot um, uh, because as soon as people are aware that they're being photographed, it changes their demeanor in some way. And uh, somewhat of that candid, spontaneous naturalness evaporates. Uh, and so I try, I try not to ever see that. Um, but um, I'll, t I'll tell you, um, one thing, this was, as I said, an early one. Uh, I, I'm a teacher at NYU in the graduate film department. I teach photography and I've been teaching, uh, cinematography, sorry, the movies. And um, I've been doing that for 20 years. Uh, we have a project in the curriculum which is called Observational Character Study. And the students are supposed to choose someone and observe them and film them. It's not a documentary. The only rule we have is no family because that's too hard to do. But just to choose someone in your life and observe them uh, and, and make a five-minute film about it. And so um, 
that got me thinking about the power of observation and how you can um, we do the project at school so that the students have um, the ability to observe true life which will make them better directors when they turn to directing actors right but to know how to observe true life it, it really does inform that particular craft so uh, I got this thing in my head of observing real life and that, that sort of got me started I decided to shoot one or two, no rules, photos uh, on my journey from Hoboken to, t to um, Tish, which is just off of Washington Square. Uh, shoot one or two a day. And I did that. I did that for about uh, a little over a year. All these photos are about a 14 month period. And then COVID happened. And suddenly, Everybody had a mask on, and half the population was no, no longer on the street. So I thought, oh, this is a very natural way to just kind of curtains on this project, and now I can begin to edit them and color correct them. And, and then I had the idea for a book. So, so um, this is all pretty much pre-COVID? Uh, Everything's pre-COVID. Right. And uh, just think of it, if they're all wearing masks, how boring it would have gotten, Well, in a way, I think. I, you know, the whole thing is faces, right? Sure, and but that's a third of your face is covered, exactly. and it, you know, a lot is hidden exactly. on there. I was thinking what, in a certain way, what you, in terms of visual design, what unifies the, these two people is the fabric in their background. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's true. Right, and uh, I, I just I wonder if they would if they happen to exchange any conversation, what it would be. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's inter Yeah, on a bus, there is like you're close to someone, yeah. but you are kind of separate, and you you know you know it's a short run, and you're not going to really get into a deep conversation. Right. But sometimes you do, and it's kind of surprising. It but happen. it's it's not like a train trip, you know, out of right, town right, or right. something, or going out on Long Island or right. whatever. So it is interesting yeah. on there, um, and uh, yeah, so. Um, Tell me more. Well, I titled this Sisters uh, because it's obvious to me <laughs> that these three people are uh, related. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this is one of the very rare ones where uh, my subject uh, caught, caught, caught me in the act. Uh, but, but you weren't hunting. I was not hunting. <laughs> this happened, just appeared right across from me. And in fact, it was the sneakers. That, that, that attracted my attention at first. And I was just going to shoot um, the one person, uh, but they were all grouped together so closely, and then I realized this, this is a beautiful family moment. Right. I mean, it's interesting you talked about how the cell phone, you, like, you could almost make it look like you're playing a game on your cell phone, but you're really taking a picture. Well, now you're giving and away all my secrets. There you go. Yeah. But I, I kind of remember another series. Was it Walker Evans who did a series on the subway, I think? Uh, and, uh, or someone with a twin lens reflex. You know, the idea you could look down and that might deceive people yeah, a little oh, bit. I see. If, you camera, if you're looking yeah. down yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you might, uh, you know, be able to... Uh, get them more naturally because yes. you're not staring at them yeah these days if you stare at someone on the subway you could you know you could almost create a little situation if you're like a little too intense well it's in the news lately and um i'm not sure uh i don't know i pre-covid i was more carefree about photographing people and uh, now I think maybe I would like to see this is a, a kind of form of self-censorship in a way that that doesn't make me very happy. Um, if, that if you like uh, don't capture a beautiful moment in, in life and you don't capture it because of fear, 
that's that's very unfortunate. It's a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. Yeah, but uh, maybe you just have to keep it in your head that moment. Yeah, that's yeah yeah sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so Again, so from the series, right on commute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. These and are these all from, all from commute, that. And yep. this is on the path. And um, I was a big fan of Mad Men at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this, so this photo is called Mad Men. Um, you know, the commuter scene is um, it's bustling, and um, people uh, find ways to not be present on the train but to be inside their phone or their uh, usually it's their phone or their mind um but um i just uh, saw a graphic moment and i really like the light so i snapped this right um it's funny when i'm on this when i'm on the public transportation that's when i check out other people's uh, shoe fashions <laughs> you know, because you don't want to stare at people or, you know, whatever. But invariably, I'm going, those are really nice shoes. <laughs> and uh, I'm always looking for new sneakers. Uh, right. None in this shot, but right. uh, I find myself, like, trying to remember the name or the brand and look it up later and things like that. Right. So. Uh, uh, sorry about uh, the um, out of focus here. I don't know how that will look. I'm so this is that. from another, this is more of a personal photo, right? This is a personal photo. And um, I could, uh, I, I just gathered together some photos for our talk today. Um, and uh, I have a lot of photographs of me with various artists and celebrities and stuff like that. And um, I, I just wanted to include one that I liked uh, because I like Alanis Morissette very much, her music and her as a person. Uh, this was taken on the set of Sex in the City, uh, which I was shooting an episode of, and she was a, a cast member at the time. Um, but, you, I, you know, I, pictures of two people, one's a celebrity, the other's a crew member, with a smile plastered on their face, it's only interesting up to a point. So the majority of the ones that I gathered for, for our talk today are uh, me uh, on set working sure. on various well, movies. Um, so let's hold off on going forward on pictures and I'm just tell us about your kind of visual career. Uh, you know, many, your cinematography is was your profession, but yes. uh, you probably you probably started with still photography, uh, going back to early school. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. My dad gave me a brownie snapshot camera when I was uh, a teenager, a young teenager, and then I became the kid who always had the camera and shot all the family events, and and then in high school I sort of became the guy who shot all the candid shots for the yearbook, you know, the wrestling team and the cheerleaders. And, you know, I shot a lot of photos that ended up in the yearbook. When I went on to college, um, I majored in theater arts. And the reason for that was not to be an actor, but because I was very interested in stage lighting. Uh, I'd been to some Broadway productions and, um, and you know, certainly, um, I was very lucky that I got to see the, the Metropolitan Opera. And the set and the lighting are just blew me away, blew me away. So I was very interested in lighting for the stage. And I think that's where I first really kind of um, graduated from just kind of snapshot photography into uh, a more artful form, you know, with good lighting and, and composition and so on. So um, uh, I, through that theater arts program, they developed a filmmaking program. This was back in the day when um, not every school had a cinema, had a filmmaking. Sure. Almost every college has a filmmaking, or at least a workshop program. So are we like 1960s or 70s, early 70s? 70, 1970. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, I enrolled in this filmmaking program and, um, and made my own 8 millimeter Super 8 short films. And I really, 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 really loved filmmaking 
Uh, and so then when I graduated and got out, uh, I got an entry level job. I was the guy who loaded the trucks. <laughs> And, um, and, it, and then I became an assistant to a cinematographer, and then I started working on lots and lots of movies. And so was that hard to make the transition from still photography to a moving image, do you think? Well, they're, they're, you know, they were, they're very related, of course, and the, the, the big difference is one has motion and the other not. But... Um, um, uh, you know, I think I obviously you need to have an eye for composition. You need to have a, an eye for lighting, and you also need to have um, a, a, an eye for uh, some some thematic um, place to l let the image grow from, right? So I found it to be a very easy transition, and what I what I discovered. So that I loved movies even more than than I loved the still the famous still photographers. Um, I began to study them, and uh, uh, there was a, a documentary film made uh, called Visions of Light, which you've seen, uh, and um, and that examines the art of cinematography from the silent era to the, through the golden Hollywood era up to the up to the present, and the film was made in the eighties. Uh, and that, that movie just really, really made me want to be a cinematographer. And, uh, yeah, but I always find it interesting, like, you know, someone like Brisson, you know, like someone you really admire in Winograd, they didn't really ever go into, or Mary Ellen Mark, or any of those people who were just like living it, they never really got into the film, moving image. Yes. And, uh, I always wonder what would have happened if they had. Would they be great filmmakers? Did they just kind of, you know, just get into a groove and stayed with it? Um, That's a really great question. And I think that the answer lies somewhere in their, not their ability, but their willingness to collaborate. Because uh, shooting a, a beautiful still is... Um, uh, it, it, it's a very solo effort unless you're unless you have a big production with hair and makeup and models and wardrobe and stuff but simple photography is a very very solo effort filmmaking requires people lots of people and everybody's got to be on the same page you know we take our cue from the director who uh, um, in prep there's a prep period, a shooting period, and then an editing period. In prep, it's the director's job to let all the collaborators, including the cinematographer, know what is this movie that I want to make? What's it look like? What's it feel like? Uh, where does it happen? Who's the protagonist? Who's the antagonist? And a good director will um, make sure that the people, that important people on the crew, understand the movie the way that person does, he or she. I think you gave a great answer. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll go back now to some of your professional career uh, sure. with visuals. And, uh, on. and what's going on? Okay, this is 1981, and we are at Lafayette and Center Street. And and it looks just like that now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that um, that that uh, little deli uh, place, uh, steaks and ice cream or whatever it says, uh, I think that's like some really highbrow, like fancy restaurant now. But anyway, um, <clears throat> this is a movie called Chud. It was a very low budget uh, horror film. Uh, Chud stands for Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. This was under a million dollar movie, and we shot it in 40 days, which is a long schedule for a very, very low budget movie. Um, but one reason that I included this photo um, is that uh, just this past summer, um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York had a, um, a, pr a summer program of the five best uh, low budget horror films filmed in New York 
and Chud was uh, closing night. And so they asked me, they made a new print of the film and they asked me to introduce it. And it was kind of surreal actually because it was just this kind of silly low budget horror film with monsters uh, made of latex, you know. Uh, and here I was at, at MoMA introducing uh, this film like uh, 40 years later. So it's quite hilarious. So, and that's you in the crane seat there, or? That's me, yeah. that's me in the crane perched right. over the scene. Um, the monsters, the Chud people had just um, caused havoc inside the little bodega restaurant and killed everybody in there, uh, ate everybody in there. And now the cops showed up. And, gotcha. Uh, so the last thing you're thinking about sitting in that chair is that 40 years from now, I'll be in Mama introducing <laughs> this piece of art. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's a great job. Okay, that's me. Um, now we're somewhere in, in the late 80s or maybe around 1990. This is Felice Bryant and her poodle. And uh, I was uh, shooting a profile of her for the Country Music Channel. Now, Felice is um, half of a songwriting team. Uh, Boodle O'Brien was her husband, and Felice Bryant, that's her. And uh, they wrote all the familiar Everly Brothers songs that you know, Bye Bye Love, Wake Up Little Susie, uh, etc. And uh, they also wrote the state song, of Tennessee and um, some other very very famous kind of the, the country music canon if you will uh, and um, in the 1950s they were a songwriting team and they would sample their music for various performers like she as she explained Hank Williams would come over to the house and he'd say what do you got and she, and they'd play their little tunes that they made up or a little a demo of it and then the artist would decide if they were going to record it or not and once they met the Everly Brothers they became stars hmm. so Louise is in the Country Music Hall of Fame and uh, she was just delightful she was just really and really down to earth and fun and you're representing New Jersey with the Stone Pony uh, T-shirt. I yeah, I was I wore that Stone Pony T-shirt a lot in those days because it was at the time the place. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, that's that's a great shot. Uh, okay, so this is the movie Big, and uh, that's Tom and the director's Penny Marshall. A lot of people remember Big because it's the one where Tom dances on the piano keys. In FAO Schwartz. Um, so, to, you know, Tom Tom is just a delight, always has been. And um, he's about as far from being a method actor as you could possibly imagine. He's just down to earth and, uh, you know, asks you, did you see that game last night? And, you know, he's just very friendly and uh, always, always made me laugh. And somehow um, the, still, the set still photographer got this photo of Tom cracking me up and Tom uh, took the time to uh, write all this stuff um, he uh, he would he would play a character called Lance Granger who is like a, a Hollywood era movie star pompous uh, egotist and uh, it, you know and he would insist that I call him sir so he's in Mr. a he's in a jacket and tie yeah. uh, for the character. That's right. And it says tone. In the old days, operators wore coats and ties and always called me Mr. Granger. Never I, just Lance. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he put words into your uh, uh, stance in a sense. Well, it was a running joke that okay. whenever he showed up on set, I would say, "Hi, Lance." <laughs> And uh, he'd say, that's Mr. Granger to you. <laughs> yeah. um, so can you, I see you're by the camera, and then I see the hands of someone else. So even the operation of the camera is a bit of a collaborative effort. Oh, so who's so. involved there? Yeah, well, a typical camera crew will be, first of all, the cinematographer, the, uh, 
called the director of photography. Uh, and that person is fully in charge of the image. Um, that person usually spends most of their time on the set uh, talking to the director and talking about the shot and uh, how to change it and how to improve it, but also talking about tomorrow's work and the next day's work after that and location scouting and all the things you need to stay on top of when you're making a film. On big, this particular shot, I was next one uh, one rung on the ladder down. On the ladder down, I was the camera operator, and that would be the person that actually executes the shot, looks through the eyepiece, and executes the shot. Uh, beyond that, there is a first assisting camera person, and the first assisting camera person is in charge of all the things to do with the camera mechanically, clean cleaning it, um, reloading it, loading it and reloading it, uh, cleaning lenses, changing lenses, any anything that needs to be done with the camera. The cinematographer doesn't touch the camera. The operator is only operating the shot. First assistant camera is in charge mechanically of the camera. And then there's usually a second assistant camera that would do the slating and a loader who loads and unloads the magazines. That's most commonly the size of a camera department. And that's one camera. You could have more than... Nowadays, uh, it's very, very common to have two or three cameras at all times. On um, these movies, uh, and that's a relatively recent... Only in the past 10 years have they been doing multiple cameras, typically on a, on a feature film. Uh, and this on those days, and certainly with that movie Big... It was all one camera, just one camera. And um, so each of the cameras would have its own crew, in a sense. You described like three or four people for a camera. Yeah. So that would be for each camera. Yes, that's right. Wow. So and the crew can get big. Right. And that's why we see all those credits in the film. <laughs> yeah. Which seem to be getting longer and longer, I by agree. the way. <laughs> well, you know, as, as, as more and more movies are made using computers and CG, uh, uh, computer graphics and uh, all kinds of special effects, a lot of those effects are farmed out to smaller companies who have a whole big staff of their own. And all of those people are credited in the, in the end credits of a movie. I actually love reading the end credits because I really learn a lot about how the movie was made. And no animals were harmed. And no animals, no, I won't work on a movie where <laughs> there's an animal harm. It's illegal now. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, even the, the animal crew is can be large on a film. That's true. Yeah, interesting. So you're there you are in the film seat again. Yeah, they're uh, shooting. This is a, a movie called For Love or Money. That's Michael Fox, Michael J. Fox. And um, uh, the leading lady of that movie, whose name escapes me right now. Uh, can't think of it. Uh, I, well, I'll think of it before we're done. Sure. But we're, we're shooting here at Tiffany's. Mm -hmm. And um, they gave us the run of the store uh, on a Sunday morning at Tiffany's starting at 6 a.m. and we had to be out by 2 if I remember correctly and um, so we shot just one scene where Michael Fox is um, under the guise of buying a piece of jewelry he's trying to pick up this very pretty sales girl so um, yeah that's a did you say, have you that. seen the documentary on Michael J. Fox? Uh, not yet. It's really good. Not yet. Really um, good. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a really unfortunate what's happened with him. I, but the way he's handled soul. it and confronts it, uh, it's kind of inspiring yeah, in a way. Yeah, that's true. That's so. true. The other thing I would say that was kind of fun about that, if we go back to Tiffany's, of course, when when you turn your store over to a movie crew, <laughs> there's a security issue, <laughs> and uh, there were a lot of real jewelry was out because of the display cases, and so at the end of the shooting day when we were wrapping, um, some people from the uh, up, upper floors of the uh, security department came down and gave us all photographs of ourselves. Uh, that were taken by the by the many 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 security cameras, 
So if anyone was thinking of sliding a diamond ring into their pocket, they would have been busted. <laughs> I Interesting. thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is Secretariat and uh, on our left and right. a film crew. <laughs> uh, I was doing a um, uh, what was it? It was a commercial for the uh, New York Racing Association, and uh, it was all about Secretariat and and the life that Secretariat lived um, as a retired stud and uh, we shot for three or four days in Lexington, Kentucky, one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen and uh, in Secretariat's stall which was I think in Paris, Kentucky couldn't have been more appropriately named um, we had uh, two or three days uh, just filming the, the horse in the foals and uh, it was it was that was cool but uh, you know um, I think that one of the, one of the best ways that I uh, in my career that I impressed my dad was showing up with a photograph of me and Secretariat, <laughs> <laughs> not Tom Hanks. No, he didn't care about that stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, and again, it was a commercial. I think it was for orange juice. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can hear Lamb Chop's, Lamb Chop's voice. Exactly. Yeah. We, you know, we all, of a certain age, we all grew up with Lamb Chops. So I had to save this photo. Um, you know, the thing uh, uh, I remember about Sherry, she was very sweet and very kind and very professional. And uh, the, when she came on the set, she introduced herself to me pleased to meet you and then she said you see that light there that should be there <laughs> and I've never been told that by an actor where to put the light but she she knew, knew. yeah uh, this is another one that my father approved of heavily yeah. <laughs> uh, this again was the New York State Racing Association and this is at Belmont Park uh, and I'm going to say that this is around uh, 1970. Um, one of my first jobs working for a company that made TV commercials. And uh, Mickey, me and Mick, Mick the Quick. Um, he, yeah. He was the legend. Him and he was. Roger Maris, right? He and Roger Maris. Actually, on this particular commercial, it was him. Uh, Somewhere I have another photo with Whitey Ford. Oh, right. The other yeah. Man. And so, uh, but I couldn't find it for today. Sure. Uh, but, uh, uh, <laughs> 1960s was, Yankees. Yeah, right? totally. Yeah. He, he was super friendly and, um, uh, you know, at 8 a.m., uh, kind of wondering when he was going to have his first beer of the day. And um, I did, um, he, you know, what you can't see in this photo is that he's wearing short pants. <laughs> and uh, I did see those scars. Those scars on his knees were pretty serious. Uh, from what? Sliding? and Or I from, don't know that from story. From multiple operations. Oh, right. Multiple sure. surgeries. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right, right. Great hair. Uh, this is uh, a commercial for MTV, and uh, someone from MTV decided that it would be really, really funny and fun if we had Tony Bennett saying, I want my MTV, which was their slogan at the, uh, in the early days. So uh, I, got to, I got to meet Tony Bennett and work with him, and that, that guy uh, in the white shirt is the director. Uh, and um, we shot this commercial, it was super fun, and I got to tell Tony Bennett how much I loved his records that he made with Bill Evans, hmm. which is really my favorite. Uh, like MTV was the, like the really hip music video yeah, um, it was, network, and, and Tony didn't really exude that uh, well, audience. Well, he, he came from another time. Yeah, and, like, kind of like Frank Sinatra. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, if you look at Tony Bennett over the years, he's always had a, an eye or an ear 
for talent um, that was, uh, you know, much younger and removed from his yeah. genre, like uh, Amy Winehouse. Sure. He, 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 uh, he would do duets mo- with, duet the, with her. the next generation. He, or the, yeah, or. and, and uh, also um, Lady Gaga, yeah. he, you know. And um, anyway, when I mentioned the, the uh, Bill Evans records, he, it really uh, perked him up, and he, he was just really gracious about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a movie called Billy Bathgate. I remember that. And um, it was a, a, compared to most of the work in my career, this was by far the biggest budget one uh, and also kind of the biggest disappointment in a way, even though I had a wonderful experience working on it. It, it, it just didn't capture the public. But um, this is Robert Benton on the right, the director Robert Benton. Right. Robert Benton directed uh, Places in the Heart, Kramer versus Kramer, uh, the, the Late Show. Uh, he was on a run of uh, big successful movies. And uh, this is me behind the camera and Dustin. And uh, one of the uh, Dustin plays Dutch Schultz, right? Gangster movie, time gangster, period. I remember yeah. now. And so uh, that gentleman behind him is uh, one of one of Dutch Schultz's lieutenants. Right. Looks like the accountant. I think one thing also that's occurring to me is, um, as I look at these, is that all of these films are shot on film, on thirty-five millimeter film, whereas today it would be a real rarity. Today it would be uh, digital. Right. Can you talk a little bit about the difference of what the audience would see, uh, for film versus digital? Yeah, um, hmm. you know, um, the companies that manufacture digital, high-end digital motion picture cameras have put a lot of attention into making their product simulate the film look, the cine look. So all the highlights and shadows and and, uh, saturation and resolution and other details like that are very, very much modeled after um, the film look. Uh, And that that is really what, what finally when they when they reach a point where they're able to do that successfully, that's when digital became the the medium of choice for Hollywood. It's uh, considerably less expensive, and you don't have that waiting period. Uh, you can see what you shot immediately, like right after you shoot the take, you can play it back and see it in full resolution on the set. So it helps, it helps the director and other people. Uh, I'm not sure it's the best thing for the time uh, constraints, but um, you know when you're shooting film, it has to be you complete your day, send the film to the lab, and you get it the next day, and you look at it the next day, and if it's not perfect, um, you have to either live with it or decide to reshoot. Um, so the advantages of digital are very apparent. Sure, and editing too, I guess. And yeah. editing too, yeah. Might be easier. Yeah. Can you tell the difference? Uh, like, you probably know a lot what's going on in the business, but can, if you went and saw, a f- uh, if you went to the cinema, would you be able to tell one shot on digital versus with, digi- with digital with film effects, shall we say, yeah, versus yeah. traditional That's film? That's a great question. Um, I would say that I could always tell the difference up until about the year 2005. Mm. And then suddenly uh, I could no longer tell the difference. Of course, if I see a movie that is very, very effects heavy, that's a giveaway that they, you know, they're going to shoot that digitally just to accommodate their post-production um, uh, special effects uh time period, um, digital lends itself to that sort of treatment much easier than film. Um, But um, I very often can't tell. 
nowadays. I'll look at a film and say, I'm really, really not sure. And that's because just the Aeroflex Corporation in particular has really, really managed to make equipment that looks a lot like film and of course using the same lenses that the film camera would use. So um, I can't tell. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, because you know a lot of people would say they're holding out, they won't do it, but most have come around. Um, most, I know. think, you know, um, well, let's see, I think it's a very short list. Steven Spielberg insists on shooting on film. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson, um, uh, Quentin Tarantino, um, you know, guys with a lot of uh, power yeah. and, and credibility in their track record have the ability to say, I'm a film guy, I'm going to shoot on, on celluloid. Sure. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, who would think it would happen? I certainly didn't in the early days of digital. Right. You know. And the same thing happened with photography, too. Yeah. That's right. right. That's and uh, cell phones are pretty amazing, as uh, you found out when you did your commute series. Yes, and now they're even better. I mean, now, I mean, I could, I look at some of the shots here in the gallery, um, and I could, you know, I, I would, it was a very good camera at the time, but uh, in certain situations, low light situations especially, it, it can be difficult um, to um, meet your expectations on uh, the quality of the photo of the image itself. Um, and uh, a lot of times, it, oh man, if I was shooting that with a film camera, it would look amazing. <laughs> Nowadays, even, even if you're just using an iPhone, uh, it, it, it blows my mind. People are shooting movies on iPhones. Right. I mean, when I go by NYU and I'm going by, you know, the film department, I see all the kids out there with their uh, harness mm -hmm. and, you mm -hmm. know, something that would have maybe carried a film camera, but they have the iPhone. That's right. And uh, yep. cheaper and well, the whole really, bit. Well, it really took hold when, um, when COVID shut down classes we assigned a uh, make a movie at home project mm -hmm. that meant within the four walls of their apartment or some location and um, uh, and not a lot of actors you know really pare it down and tell a simple story and follow the rules of covid <laughs> right so um i that's where people were shooting really good movies with their iphones i was so pleased with how that worked out and uh, I can almost see the kids adapting quicker than the professors. Totally. <laughs> totally. A lot of times uh, they'll be aware of some menu setting, like deep in the iPhone, that I, I've never heard about. You know, oh, I'll just use the zebra setting or, you know, you know I try not to let him use the autofocus, right? <laughs> because it, you know, like, make it a little bit like a movie, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, they teach us. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I knew that, but it takes it takes a lot to admit that. Anyone, anyone with an adolescent knows if you have a computer question, go to them. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Um, okay, so we're back to wow. They're really grooming you a lot in these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they like that. Uh, Dustin had, um, you know, he he would shave himself on the set while he was getting ready for picture and he just had the razor in his hand one day and he said you know I'm tired of you showing up with all that stubble on your face and he, he kind of made a little bit of a show of it uh, for the rest of the crew. For a second I thought it was an iPhone with a <laughs> shaver on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no he shaved me. <laughs> Uh, this is in Los Angeles, and uh, I did a short film for PBS uh, with David Byrne, and who we see here, and Rosanna Arquette was in it, and um, it was uh, the first time that I worked with Jonathan Demme. He was the director, and we had met in New York and became friendly, and he just phoned me up one day and said, I'm going to send you something to read. And uh, if you like it, uh, I want you to shoot it. And I said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> so that was fun. David was fun. 
Again, here's Jonathan. This is way many, many, many years later. This is about a year or a year and a half before he died. Uh, we are at the Jersey Shore. Where are we? We're at Wildwood. And um, this was a concert with Kenny Chesney. Jonathan Demi loved shooting music, and I worked with him on um, Talking Heads film and um, a couple of Neil Young films and uh, shot a couple of music videos uh, with bands that Jonathan liked. And so this one was for American Express uh, program um, on location with Kenny Chesney. And they actually built a stage on the, on the, um, on the beach in Wildwood. So the boardwalk is in the background. We're way out on the beach near where the, near where the surf was. Uh, breaking um, underneath the stage and um, we shot this concert with uh, I think about 10 cameras and I was uh, the director of photography. Looks like uh, not too many spaces in the audience. It, it just you know people people love country music and right. Kenny Chesney's such a huge star and you know we just we built the stage and they showed up. <laughs> Uh, we're back here now. This is a movie called Philadelphia, which Jonathan Demme directed. Forgot he did that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another another really fine, fine, fine movie that I love and had a really great experience uh, working on. So this is Denzel, and Denzel played a lawyer along with Tom Hanks uh, in this film. And uh, the gentleman in the middle with the goatee... Uh, is Patrick Capone, uh, resident of Leonia, and uh, he was my assistant for several movies. Uh, we, we were a team, we worked together. Uh, now uh, that I'm a teacher, Pat is the cinematographer of a TV show that a lot of people love, including me, called Succession. And so Pat's a DP there. The other thing I can say about this photo is uh, the gentleman whose back is to the camera on the far left with the ponytail, his name is John McAleer, and uh, I worked with him for years and years as a, a member of the camera department. I think he was a loader on this film. But John was a member of the Hoboken Volunteer Fire Department huh. from uh, his teenage years. Would that be Ambulance Corps or Fire Department? I mean, we have a professional fire uh, department, not to correct you. but no, Well, I'm all I, I know is the ambulance guys. Oh, that that's that. It's Ambulance Corps. Ambulance, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I first moved to Hoboken, I would see that if something was going on, I'd go up to the ambulance guys yeah. when they weren't too busy and say, uh, uh, any chance you know John McAleer? Okay. And they'd all go, Johnny! <laughs> How is Johnny? Right. You know. So, yeah, they're on 7th and Clinton, I think. So, yeah, they're a mainstay here in Hoboken. <laughs> uh, here we are. This, again, is um, the movie Philadelphia. and um, Your friend that, Tom. That's my friend Tom Hanks. And this, this was actually the, one of the very, very last scenes in the movie. Uh, I don't think I'd be giving too much away because the movie's pretty old. And <laughs> this is his last scene before he dies uh, right. of AIDS. Right. And he's playing around with the viewfinder that we use that to find a shot without having to drag a lens or a, a camera around. Uh, but uh, that's Patrick Capone again, my focus puller, my assistant. And uh, we're, you know, this that entire film was shot in Philadelphia, uh, on location. Right. So we're in a we're in a hospital. Sure. I mean, as I remember, he, you know, Tom Hanks' big star, and to play that role was kind of a big deal. It was. You yeah. know, most actors might not take it on. Well, he was very, very brave, and uh, you know, the character has AIDS, and the character dies, and. And the character is gay and all of that stuff. And uh, he was very, he was just amazing to take it on. He lost like 60 pounds right. for the movie. And, you know, when we would break for lunch and go to, you know, every big movie has a caterer. And we'd go to the caterer and everybody would be having their fish and, you know, desserts and stuff. And Tom would have a little plate with a few carrots on it and maybe a cracker. <laughs> and that would be his lunch. 
uh, and you know that was a source of a lot of humor too. Right. I, I used to ask him if I could have a carrot. <laughs> Uh, another Jonathan Demme movie, this one's called Something Wild, and um, this was the first feature film uh, that I worked on with Demme, uh, and it had to be around 85, no, maybe 86. Uh, and so um, the actors there are Melanie Griffith in the white dress, and Jeff Daniels, um, well, a very young Jeff Daniels, terrific guy, uh, and they play they play a couple uh, cruising for trouble. Yeah, <laughs> I remember them. Movie. They were wild, definitely. Yeah. And so we have a one of the operators uh, measuring the distance for what depth of field and just making sure they have focus down. Exactly. This is a part of the routine of setting up a shot before you shoot it. You need to get focus marks, and um, the uh, the guy standing next to me is actually pulling focus, right? And the guy holding the tape measure, uh, when we're laying out the uh, logistics of the shot, he would, you know, hold the tape measure up to Melanie and say, you know, four feet three inches, and and then the focus puller would rec uh, make a note of that, so that then when we shoot the scene. He can keep whoever's speaking usually in sharp focus. So I'm just thinking, even on big production films, and now with the digital setup and the cameras being, or the digital uh, reacting so sensitively, is lighting as much a concern in in some cases? I mean, do they do they lighting takes so much time to set up? Yeah. Do you think they're letting go a little bit on that? Well, that depends on the um, the power, really, of the cinematographer. If the cinematographer is, uh, uh, I shouldn't say just the cinematographer, but the cinematographer and the director um, together, if they, ha if they have a, um, a visual style that they want to enforce, um, then the lighting becomes incredibly important, and it takes just as long in the digital age as it did in the in the in the in the celluloid film age. Uh, even though the a lot of the actual lighting instruments are smaller and lighter and don't give off as much heat, you still need to, as we like to say, you still need to paint the canvas. Right. So there's also a lot that you can do nowadays to um, paint the image a little bit. In post-production, in the editing process, you usually go through a period after the movie is what they say picture locked, it means the visual editing is complete. Uh, then we go into a grading session, which is where we adjust all the colors and the contrast and. Uh, a lot. It's kind of like uh, using the the brush with the very very fine bristles. Got it. So the painting analogy holds. It does. <laughs> uh, this is another shot of me and Jonathan Demme. Uh, this is during something wild, and um, <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of a rarity that a director will look through a viewfinder these days. Um, um, now every every director has their own monitor, and um, there are usually several departments on a on a film that will have their own monitor, so you can see what's going on. This movie was just about at the time where video assist was becoming acceptable on on bigger pictures. So uh, this was a, a movie where the director needed to check the frame through the, through the eyepiece. Um, now we're in Milan, and um, we did a documentary about Giorgio Armani. And um, so we see Giorgio here. The gentleman in the white pants is Martin Scorsese. He directed it. And, uh, and the girl is a model um, uh, with her overcoat on because uh, we weren't ready for picture. And normally they keep covered up until it's time to roll. 
anyway, it was a story of uh, Giorgio Armani's artistic process and also about his growing up in the north of Italy and his childhood in uh, Lake Como in, in the, you know, the Finger Lakes um, in northern Italy. Uh, we went to all those places and filmed him. It was a joy and, um, uh, you know, um, Scorsese was kind of uh, influenced a lot by Giorgio because Scorsese was making gangster movies and Armani loved the classic American gangster films where, with the double-breasted suits and the shoulder pads. That, this was the era of that uh, uh, fortune, uh, fashion trend. So um, they, uh, they met up through that and Giorgio said, uh, let's do a documentary about my life. Huh. So I got invited and the cinematographer was Nestor Almendros, who uh, is a big part of that movie that we were talking about earlier, Visions of Light. Nestor was my mentor, and um, we became very, very close friends, and um, I worked with him on his last three movies before he passed. Uh, had a big effect on me. Uh, so there was a scene in the uh, Armani documentary where uh, Giorgio was sketching uh, ideas uh, when he's talking about his process, which begins with pen and paper. And uh, he sketched this in front of me, live in front of me. And when we finished the shot, I said, well, can I have that? <laughs> and he said, oh, yes, of course, Anthony. And uh, he signed it, and I kept it. Neat. Neat. And his staff was a little miffed at me really that's supposed to go in the archive yeah, right. right you don't take that but Giorgio <laughs> said what are you talking about got give it. it to him got it um, now we're at the Beacon Theater uh, in uh, I would say this was around 2010 uh, the Rolling Stones did um, two nights in the Beacon uh, Martin Scorsese was the director we shot it on 35 millimeter which mm. is just unheard of uh, to shoot a concert film nowadays on film, you'd never be able to do it. Uh, and we had 15 cameras. Wow. When I walked in on the first day, uh, we, were, we had 12 cameras set up. And I said to myself, they're probably going to cut this down to eight, eight or nine. And it, instead of that, it grew. <laughs> Uh, because Marty just loves shooting a lot of angles, a lot of coverage, a, you know, a camera on every member of the, uh, of the band and uh, combination shots and moving shots and so on. So um, I just took this moment to grab uh, Ronnie Wood and say, hey, can I get a photo with you? And he said, oh, yeah. And the uh, 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 lady there is, was one of my students who I brought on uh, to be uh, a mag runner, meaning when, after they uh, load the magazine at a central location, the, the runners will run the magazine during the show to the camera for reloading purposes. So you have to keep track of what cameras need to be reloaded and when. And she was uh, part of that crew. She did a great job. And um, uh, I said, uh, Ronnie, I want to introduce you to one of my students. This is Christina. And he said, uh, <laughs> as, as he's probably said a million times, he said, Christina, that was me mom's name. <laughs> and that, that's kind of the way into a conversation for Ronnie Wood. But uh, Christina now is the cinematographer. This is wonderful for me because my students go on to having these wonderful careers, and I'm so proud of them. Uh, Christina is the cinematographer of a TV show called Yellowstone, which is really popular. So do you think there's more uh, female uh, women in the business and cinematographers uh, as time marches forward? It's getting better. It's getting better. Uh, I think uh, I'd be taken to task if I said, oh yeah, it's really good now, um, because uh, after a hundred years of 
cinematographers being, you know, white men, um, there's been progress, as there have in other areas of the arts and in life. Uh, so Christina, um, she's a groundbreaker. She was mm -hmm. brave. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, this was a crew shot from that same show at the Beacon Theater with the Rolling Stones. Uh, as I said, we had 17 cameras, and um, uh, these are all cameramen uh, that were operating the shots. And um, I, you know, these people are all my good friends, but they're also um, some of the greatest cinematographers in the world in this photograph, and many of them have won Oscars uh, for their work. Uh, I will point out the gentleman seated with the uh, striped sweater there. That's Al Mazel right, of the, the Mazel's brothers. Uh, Gray Gardens and yeah, Gray Salesman. Gardens. And yes. A lot very, of the... very important documentaries from the 60s right. that he and his brother made together. And he, the, he was a living, he's passed away now. Right. But at the time, he was like a living legend among our crew. And uh, there, uh, of course, is Martin in the middle, and uh, Robert Richardson over on the far right with the very long hair. He has been Scorsese's main cinematographer, I think, for the past um, you know five or six or more movies, um, uh, The Departed and um, um, uh, The Wolf of Wall Street and. A lot, of, a lot of the ones that are more recent are Robert Richardson shot. But all of these guys are all stars in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, toward the end of Silence of the Lambs. Um, oh, I remember this night. <laughs> This was... Oh, so uh, that's Jodie Foster. That's Jodie. I, mean, I almost didn't recognize her. Yeah, that's Jodie, and that picture's a little water damaged, but I had to save it anyway. Uh, this was uh, on location um, the last day of shooting uh, before we had our break for Christmas holidays. And so we shot, I think, uh, from November to near Christmas, and then we took two weeks off. And we came back and finished the rest of the movie. Um, so this was that night, and it was a night shoot, uh, where we were shooting uh, in, inside of a garage where Jody discovers, uh, uh, <laughs> in this, if you know The Silence of the Lambs, it's a shot where she discovers a head in a glass jar inside of a car. And um, um, it was... I think the coldest night of the year in Pittsburgh. It was under 10 degrees and we shot from like 6 p.m. as soon as it got dark until 4 in the morning. And Yikes. that's what life on a movie set is like very often. Uh, and now we are still, uh, this is also Science of Lamps, and we're, this is a set. Um, we had sets built there was a refrigerator factory. I think it was an old Westinghouse refrigerator factory that was now abandoned. And uh, the production company leased it for our uh, sets to be built. And we shot there for uh, many, many weeks. And it was really cold and really dirty. Uh, but, you know, um, this, you know, people ask me, oh, oh, wow, Silence of the Lambs, that must have been intense to work on. And my response to that is, we laughed every day. Uh, Tony Hopkins was really clever, really funny, had a lot of jokes. He was interested in all things American. Uh, I, he would want, particularly with me, he would want me to explain the rules of baseball because he just couldn't understand it <laughs> and so that was what a lot of our conversation was about like you know when you're out and when you're safe and when you strike out and when and um you know i think this is a great shot to show that you know it wasn't all horror it was uh we had a lot of laughs 
And there's always a lot of time where you're just waiting for something to yeah. get the go-ahead. So just right. that banter and conversation, getting to know each other, is really important. It is. It is important in the, in, in the role I was in and in, in the role of the director and the cinematographer and uh, production designer. You really need to have some kind of relationship with the actors, even if it's just exchanging pleasantries. Uh, because you know you're really you're practically living together for months, and um, Tony Hop Anthony Hopkins was one of those guys who's very very accessible and really really loved uh, just chatting uh, during the waiting periods. So that was a lot of fun. Um, well, if you go back for a sec, um, I tell you what's going on here. Um, I was doing a shot of Jody where she was in conversation with uh, Hannibal the Cannibal, Hannibal Lecter. And in order for his eye line to be uh, at the proper angle, he had to be perched on the dolly right over my shoulder. And so he just was, uh, he climbed on and said, let's shoot it. So you were going for that perspective. That, that very, very tight right. eye line. They had we, to match in a way. We, yeah, the, the, for cutting purposes, you have to know where the actors are looking when you cut from one to the other, and so that's part of the job. Right. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a year later, um, after this movie won five Academy Awards, uh, Jonathan Demi gave a big party for the crew. And we all got to take turns holding the, that's the Oscar for Best Picture for that year. The movie won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was a big celebration. And we all got to hold the Oscar and have our picture taken and have our children hold the Oscar and have their picture <laughs> taken. And, Everybody's got a picture with the Oscar. Again, uh, during Silence of the Lambs. Now, I'll go back to saying that this is a set. This is, um, uh, this is not a real well. Um, it, it's, it's all made of plaster and metal. And um, uh, Christy Zia uh, was the production designer of the movie. And she uh, designed all of this stuff. and and uh, oversaw the construction of it. So there's a, a series of shots in the film where um, the bad guy, um, he's holding a woman captive at the bottom of the pit. And uh, we had to do shots looking down at her sobbing. And then we had to do reverse shots of um, Buffalo Bill was his name. Uh, uh, of, uh, of scaring her and holding his poodle and uh, all of that stuff. People who know the movie will remember this stuff well. So they had to lower me in a bucket. And uh, that's uh, the camera there is in the handheld position. So I'm, it's resting on my shoulder so that I could look up and, and shoot him from down in there. And so there's one guy who has his rope and you're being uh, pulled down there? Uh. <coughs> yeah, actually that is just a safety line okay. in case of anything. <laughs> we, the last thing you'd want is for the camera to tumble down to the ground. And the operator. And the, <laughs> and the operator. I'm in this bucket which is hooked up to a hydraulic lift. Oh, okay, I feel better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are now inside the cage. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is kind of a tradition where the actors will sign a picture for crew members to have a safe keep. Um, yeah, we're, uh, you know, again, if you know the movie, you know that there's lots and lots of time spent inside cages. <laughs> and uh, Tony Hopkins was one of those that, that he, he, he just, uh, when we would break for lunch and stuff, he would say, oh, can they bring me my lunch here? He liked to stay there. <laughs> and uh, it, it's kind of helped him with his character of being always, always caged up. So uh, we were, here we are talking probably about baseball. Uh, now we jump to a considerable number of years later. This is uh, NYU, and I am teaching a class here um, 
about how to read a light meter. And um, I'm looking at these students and they've all gone on to have careers in the movie business. So it's really great. But um, the location of this is actually a set that is built uh, at the Tisch School of the Arts on our teaching stage. And we have a set there that's kind of more or less uh, trying to be like a New York City apartment. Kind of has a, uh, yeah, okay, law and order feel or something. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, our students actually shoot mostly uh, inside of, uh, because uh, our, being in New York program, uh, we uh, embrace the idea of independent filmmaking um, in New York. <laughs> and so um, most of their shooting takes place on real New York City locations, which is either exterior or an apartment. So we have a, 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 a we built a set that replicated the feel of a New York City apartment. Right. So they could practice. And uh, I remember we're getting towards the end, I believe, right? And yes. this is uh, connected with uh, an up or an ongoing or a new project. Yes, this is uh, kind of what I'm working on now. In addition to this. Uh, this show here at the museum. Um, but uh, this has been a, a, a documentary film about this, the African American guy there that is a producer, a record producer named Tom Wilson. And Tom Wilson is probably the most overlooked record producer in the history of the music business. I mean, when you ask people name a record producer, most people will say George Martin produced the Beatles, or they'll say Phil Spector, <laughs> who um, messed up his life, but uh, before he messed up his life, he produced a ton of classic American records. Well, Tom Wilson um, was the only black record producer at Columbia Records in the 1960s, and he was a very imposing guy six foot five, and he was in the jazz department uh, producing people like Sun Ra uh, and um, John Hammond asked him to, if he would be interested in producing Bob Dylan, which was kind of a, a very unusual call to go from pretty complex jazz to folk, but it turned out to be a brilliant idea. And Tom Wilson produced, um, I think, uh, the second, third, and fourth uh, Bob Dylan albums, which are some of his most famous, Bringing It All Back Home, uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues, and I think parts of Blonde on Blonde, uh, some of Bob Dylan's most famous stuff. And um, there's an artist named Marshall Crenshaw who um, had Marshall's just a, a wonderful musician, artist, performer. Uh, he had uh, many, he had some hit records and uh, some platinum albums uh, in the 80s and 90s and in the 2000s, he's still touring. But um, the story of Tom Wilson is, is Marshall Crenshaw's passion. And he really wants to make a document. He's in, been in the process for years now of uh, bit by bit putting together the story of Tom Wilson and his life. And um, he called me and asked me if I would be interested in shooting some of the interviews that he was doing with some scholars of music. Uh, and that kicked off a kind of a friendship that we have. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'll continue to um, help Marshall in any way I can because I love this subject uh, until until uh, the film gets made. And it will get made. It will get made in the next year, I think. <laughs> I okay, sounds good. Um, so we spent most of the time talking about your professional career, and it's hard not to with all the people you've hung out with, so I'm glad we did that. Yeah. Uh, but we do want to remind people we got an exhibit up here that they should check out. 
And uh, you had mentioned uh, a story about Hoboken you wanted to share. You live in Hoboken, right? You, I do. I you do. love Hoboken. You love the commute. I love, well, I love Hoboken for more reasons than the commute. But when I moved here, it was really because I wanted my children grow up and uh, they left the nest. And uh, I was living in Summit, New Jersey, and just didn't need a house with that many bedrooms anymore. So I uh, moved to Hoboken, and um, uh, I just came to love the town. Uh, of course, it was a very easy commute to NYU. But, you know, as I got to meet people and coming here frequently and going to the guitar bar and getting to know Jim Mastro and uh, some, of the, some of the great restaurants, I, I really come to love this town a lot. It's great. You know, I was just thinking about it today. Um, you know, we're right next door to New York City. And when you look at, like, the, 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 the mayor's newsletter of what's happening in Hoboken this summer, he talks uh, it, it articles about the uh, volunteer spaghetti dinner and, the, you know, uh, and things that are just, just kind of like as far away from Manhattan as you could imagine. And we're right next door. So uh, that's another thing I really love about it. Uh, of course, the river walk is very special. Anyway, um, so as a kid growing up, I would come through Hoboken like most people on the train, and then it would just be walking from the train platform to the path, and that's all I knew about Hoboken. And uh, uh, when I wanted to get my very, very first cell phone, there was a friend of mine who was also a cinematographer who had a cell phone and he wanted to move up to the next model. <laughs> and in those days, cell phones were, you know, really ridiculously expensive, uh, not just the hardware, but also the bills and all of that. But I, I felt like I needed a phone. So I, I arra we arranged that I would buy his phone. And he'd say, yeah, I'll sell it to you, but you have to come to where I'm working today. And I said, where's that? And he said, it's in Hoboken. Do you know where that Maxwell House uh, factory used to be? And I said, yeah, I think so. By, It's by the bar, right? By that Maxwell. Yeah, he was, yeah meet me there. So I went there, and um, it was pure rubble. It was a big lot of rubble right on the river. None of those uh, high rises were there yet. Uh, and l literally, I had to uh, like walk over piles of piles of bricks to get to where the, he was with the camera set up, and, and he had the phone ready for me. But when I arrived, they were just about to do a shot, so I had to wait. And then I waited. I had no idea what they were doing. All of a sudden, a blue and white P New York City police car drives up, and Telly Savalas gets out and, you know, and says, uh, you know, <laughs> I put him under arrest <laughs> doing his, um, his, um, with the lollipop. <laughs> what was this Kojak. show? Kojak. Kojak. It was Kojak. And I got to see a, a moment from Kojak with Telly Savalas when I bought my first phone. And now I live uh, about half a block away from where that happened. Gotcha. Right at Hudson so, and the full circle. Full circle. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. So this was really interesting. I, you know, we went longer than we probably normally Did do, we? and we probably could keep going. But uh, I had a lot of fun. I hope you Me enjoyed too. it. Yes. And uh, you know, really encouraging people to come to the opening on Sunday and uh, hear more stories and check out some great photos from the commute series. Yes. And will, will you be photographing people at the opening or? Probably not. Okay, <laughs> okay, we'll be photographing you. We'll turn the camera around. Okay, that's anyway. good. Anyway, um, so Roger Kelman, a great interview. Tony, very interesting and engaging talk. Thank, Thank you. you, that's great. Uh, John Ozed, Tom Wilson produced Dylan and the Velvet Ever Underground. That's true. Wow. So, and uh, so uh, we're going to segue out here. We have a few thank yous. Again, a reminder, opening is this Sunday, May 21st. We'll have some refreshments. Hope you come check it out. And uh, 
we have a lot of upcoming events with the museum. You can check out the website, but we do want to thank our funder for the upper gallery exhibits, which is New Jersey Hudson County Cultural Arts and Heritage Affairs. And uh, we do want to remind people that our main gallery exhibit will be on display until the end of the year, December 23rd, 2023. It opened in January, and we've had a lot of attention uh, about this exhibit and a lot of responses. And, uh, you know, it's not a permanent exhibit, and every town does have its, shall we say, dark side at times, and that is the the focus of that exhibit in the main gallery. Also want to thank all the key supporters of the museum, uh, the ones with Asterix, our current trustees who helped the museum from going off the rails, and uh, a lot of names you'll probably recognize. Uh, so thank you Shipyard Circle supporters. And then uh, coming up on Hoboken Talks uh, will be uh, Jack Silbert, one of our popular uh, hosts, interviewers, will be uh, interviewing the musician Elena Skye. And again, uh, Hoboken Talks now runs uh, two times a month on Thursdays. I believe it's the second and the last of the month. Uh, I may have that wrong, so you'll have to check your schedule on that. And uh, again, uh, this program can be viewed on uh, uh, the museum's uh, YouTube channel. And you can comment and share and send uh, likes or dislikes to other people. But uh, we're very proud of this program. And want to thank uh, Rand Hoppe, who is our engineer and also keeps us on the rails for the program. He did a great job tonight, thank as you, he always does. And uh, we're, again, we're with the Hoboken Historical Museum, a full-time cultural institution here in Hoboken, and been doing our thing here f since 2001 at the space at 1301 Hudson Street. It's a fantastic place. Come. Come visit. Thank you for the plug. You're invited back. <laughs>